Hi, it's uh, Stephen and Simon, and congratulations. You've reached the end of the course. Uh, we hope you found it very useful and interesting. Um, we're just kind of, we thought we'd give you some uh, a bit of feedback about what we uh, saw you guys discussing this, this week and in the past week, uh, or I guess temporarily this week, but over the last two weeks of the course material. Um, and one thing we've seen people talking a lot about is, is static types, and kind of most people wishing that Erlang had a I guess a, a more statically typed system, um, which we thought was kind of uh, interesting. I guess because there's, a, you know, they're kind of it's one of those two camp things that people really um, kind of fight over a little bit. Um, I don't know. What, kind of, there's I, a lot. Of, I think it's tricky. I mean, the yeah. argument in favor of of the Erlang approach is there are no barriers in you getting started. Yeah, that's and true. And so if you look at people's uh, practice of adopting programming languages, one of the things people say is, you know, they want to be able to get started quickly. Yeah. So with something like Erlang, you don't have a complicated type system to get in your way. But by the same token, you don't have a complicated type system to help you. Yeah. So I think one thing that does happen with a type system, um, something like Haskell, is that you can do what people call type-driven development. Yeah. So you, in writing a function, the first thing you write down, or the first thing you think about, are what types does involve. That might inv that might mean you defining some new types for yourself, um, and then you think, what are the types of the functions mm -hmm. that I'm using? And only finally do you define the functions themselves. And if the type checking is incorporated into the the compiler, into the language processor, then as you type, you can get feedback um, on what you're doing. Yeah. And in fact, for some very strongly typed languages like Agda which is a dependently typed language, you can actually get the compiler to do some guesswork and perhaps a bit of, of machine learning. No, in fact, it's usually just guesswork to try and help you complete. You say, I want something that will go in this hole. I know it's of this particular type. And Agda can, um, a system bolted onto Agda, can tell you, oh, why don't you try this? Yep. And often that is the right thing. Um, should, should we mention Connor? If, if, you, can, if you can find a, a lecture by Connor McBride, he, uh, he uses Agda in most of his, his talks. Yes. And it's, it, they're, they're technical, but it's interesting seeing someone who can use that system very well. Yes, exactly. So for instance, he gave a talk at CodeMesh in London last November, and you could find a video for that yeah. online. So that would be a that would be a place to start looking at, um, at something like Agda, and, and particularly looking hard at type-driven development. Um, that being said, yeah. Dialyzer will give you a lot of, of um, of feedback. It won't necessarily give you as much feedback as a, an integrated type checker, but getting into the habit of writing type definitions, yep. writing specs, and using those is, does make sense. You get you get return for that, particularly when you start writing a, um, a more complicated program. So, it's frustrating you know, if you mistype something, like you type a small x, which makes it an atom, yes. rather than a large x, which makes it a variable. Um, you may well, if you compare small x with large x, you won't get an error, but it may well not mean what you meant. Yes, which um, is um, just kind of one of the costs of, of yes. dealing with a type system like this. Yeah. Um, and also, um, just when you're dealing with lists, for example, you can quite often um, type a list of lists rather than a list somewhere. And if you do that, then um, Something with a type checker will will tell you that, or is much more likely to tell you that than than Erlang would on its own. So there are there are real advantages. So we've also kind of heard some talks about kind of the practicality okay. of, of programming languages and, and, and kind of the the broader broader scope or kind of the, the larger environment that, that functional programming um, sits in. And we didn't do ourselves any favors by mentioning uh, Agda, I'm afraid. But no, okay. There are plenty of um, very practical uses for functional programs. Yeah. yeah, I mean, if you look, OCaml, for example, is used in in the um, in defining the Zen operating system. It's used in implementing parts of Docker. Um, it's used in a lot in, in system programming level things. Haskell gets used. We saw some remarks. That Haskell is just a, a, a language for teaching functional programming. It is a language for that, but it's not only that. The, we're seeing more and more jobs in the last. Two or three years, yeah. um, large corporations using Haskell, for example, Facebook are using Haskell in 
Um, no, so Google X are using Haskell. Well, and fa Facebook as well. And Facebook as well. Um, it, has a, it has fairly deep roots in the financial industry. Yeah, that's true. And also you, you see an increasing number of startups yep. who are building them their, um, you know, their secret weapon their, their, um, is the fact that they're programming in Haskell. And that, that, that idea that you can get extra productivity and so on from using a functional language, is, language goes all the way back to Paul Graham who was the founder of Y Combinator, mm. who did a, a Lisp startup. And, you know, Lisp was his secret weapon there. Yeah. Um, so I think you know, these, we're saying that ML family languages, Haskell, are getting used in practice. So I yeah. think that's, that's often the case. So if you want to find out more specifically about functional programming, there are online um, sources of um, teaching materials, yeah. there are MOOCs for Haskell and OCaml, there are other things. We'll put the links for these into the um, YouTube page for the video that yeah. you're watching. In, in the description. Bro, in the it? description, yeah. yeah. Um, the other language I'd like to mention here is Elm. Um, that's getting a lot of discussion. Um, it's a lightweight function language, it looks quite like Haskell. Yeah. Very, very similar syntax. Um, runs in the browser, and there is an online environment for trying that out. So the, well, the Elm web page is a good place to, to yep. start looking at that. So lots of things you can do if you want to push things in the functional direction. Yep. But you, we're on an Erlang course, and the, what the key thing, the, the foundation of Erlang is functional. Yep. The key thing about Erlang is it's a concurrent language designed to build fault-tolerant, robust systems. And if you want to find out more about that, the companion loop to this on Concurrent programming in Erlang is starting on the um, 7th of August. Yep. So you've got a bit of time to consolidate what you've done on the functional programming to side. To catch up. Yeah. Catch up, yeah. Complete the course. Um, and you can, you don't have to join the, the concurrency course by the 7th, you can join when the course is running. But if you're interested, we encourage you to sign up to that to get a chance to see what concurrent programming in Erlang looks like. Kind of the, the real selling point. The real should, selling point. That's say. why that's why I say WhatsApp use it. It's not because it's a nice functional language, it's because it gives them blindingly fast, scalable concurrency. Yeah. Okay, so I think that's, that's yeah. it from us. Thanks very much for joining us on the course. We yeah. enjoyed seeing your comments, seeing you make progress. Yeah, very much. We hope to see you in uh, just about a month, I guess. Yeah. Okay, Yeah. good. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.